My name is John Sterrett. I'm from Austin, Texas, and I do a lot of amazing things with performance tuning, but today I'm giving one of my favorite talks, which I've done at multiple conferences before, which is kind of lessons learned from going independent and kind of starting out on your own. So I, I have to admit, um, when I was growing up, I loved watching shows that were more startup based. So I learned a lot from there. Here's a whole bunch of stuff about me and stuff that I've done. Um, the one thing I do want to focus on though, if you can, is the QR code over there. That is the evaluation for this session here. If you can, please definitely go ahead and scan that and get that going. Um, I really would love your feedback because I would love to be able to come back here. Um, I think the scale is from zero to nine. If you give a nine, great. If you, if you give anything less than that, the only thing I ask for you is please put in some comments in there on why so I can kind of learn from, from why you thought I shouldn't get a nine and so I can improve this talk uh, going forward here. But yeah, basically I love SQL and data and that's kind of the summary of that. So the goal for today's session here today is to share lessons learned. Wow, way back in 2014, I'm actually, I think, two weeks away from my nine-year anniversary of actually kind of going from being a database architect. I used to work for Dell on the shopping cart and actually jumping into independent consulting and then from there even going to a CEO. And while I think I had a pretty good path, I think there's a lot of lessons that I learned the hard way um, that I wished I didn't have to. And so a lot of that is kind of shared into a couple of slides here that I'm gonna focus on today for you. So the three agenda items, if you looked at the session online, it's to talk a little bit about how you go through and actually set your rates. Then where do we actually go to find some gigs. So if you've never gone through the process of that, I'm gonna give you some, some good ideas for the short term, and then also go about how you could be really successful with having people come to you long term as well. And then the one thing that I really, really wish I learned from the very beginning is to not be afraid to say no. It seems very easy, but as you actually build your portfolio and your work, you really need to focus on that one thing that you are amazing at. Because when you do that, people are going to think of you. So for example, I live in Austin, Texas. Whenever people have SQL Server problems in Austin, I'm usually one of the first people that come to mind for a lot of people. And that's because I've run the user group there, I've done a lot of amazing things with SQL Server there, and so my name comes to mind for a lot of people there. But, one of the things I struggled with too was actually not saying no. So if you ever went to my blog, johnsterrett.com, why I am mostly known for performance tuning, I actually started blogging about how to build data warehouses and kind of went all over the place, which actually kind of hurt me more than focusing on the one thing that I wanted to be great at. So we'll dive into that there too. And so we're gonna go ahead and start with the first one. How do I set my rates? And so for a lot of people, it's kinda of put something out there and see which way the wind blows. But first, I wanna talk about some common mistakes that I've made and I've seen a lot of my peers make as well here for you. So the one thing you really wanna focus on is driving value. And so a big mistake that a lot of people do is they focus on bill rate or hours focusing on breaking everything down to I have to set cost per hour and I'm gonna do X amount of hours. So kind of an easy example that even I started with way back when was, okay, I was smart enough to know that I need to do other stuff other than just actually do performance tuning. So instead of doing 2,000, because roughly there's about 2,000 hours in a year, I would say, okay, I'm gonna work 1,000 hours and I'm gonna try to bill at 200 so that way I can make enough to hopefully offset the time spent for doing other things that would help with running the business. So for example, marketing, speaking at conferences, invoicing, all the operational fun stuff that um, if you wanna go independent, you must really love what you do because you're gonna find out you're actually be doing less of it and a lot of operational stuff while you get things up and running here. 
So the big mistake there was actually focusing on an hourly rate and buckets of hours. So for example, I would go through and my goal was bill a thousand hours, try to bill $200 an hour, you know, basic multiplication there, that gets you around $200,000. So again, I'm from America, so I apologize. I didn't want to confuse things and try to guess about converting from dollars to pounds. So I'll, I'll mention dollars a lot here in my talk here, just because I'm from American, please, please don't shoot me. Um, but so trying to keep the rate the same also seems like a great idea when you're starting, right? You want to keep things simple and easy going. But really, the one thing you're going to learn from this presentation is I'm going to focus a lot on actual value that you're going to drive. And the value is going to help you be able to charge a lot more and have customers perfectly fine with paying more money, too, as you build that value. But as I was starting out, you know, I'd do buckets of hours and, you know, we would renew them. And actually, as I grew, it became a nightmare. Um, so the next one there is not increasing your rate over time. So one thing I am going to talk about is becoming a thought leader. And a thought leader basically is you being known in some area, whether it's your local town that you live in or even bigger, as an expert and people thinking of you. And I've actually had people come up and send me emails or phone calls saying, I want to get started. Let's just swipe the credit card and go. And so as you establish yourself as a thought leader, it allows you to do that and even bill rates that you may think is a little crazy and people not even think twice about signing up and doing it. And then the last one there, which I've mentioned a little bit already, is just not focusing on value. You should really focus on what is valuable to the customer. Why do they need you to do whatever it is you're doing? You know, whether it's building HADR, a modern data warehouse, moving data between systems, whatever it is. Try to fully get in and understand the real business purposes and purpose and justification for the company and why they want to do it and how valuable it is for them. Understanding those key things will allow you to understand how important it is to them. You know, for example, do they just want someone to call in the middle of the night in case something's broken? That's not a real valuable relationship. And that's one you probably would want to stay away from just for the fact that you could sleep at night. But fully understanding this can be a, a great helpful tool for you for actually increasing it and setting your rates. So and the next thing I want to do, this is just a big comparison of like where I started and what I see a lot of people do and where I think you really want to try to go to. And it's been very, very successful for me and my company as we've grown from me to having six full-time engineers working. So the very first one is your common bucket of hours. You know, it's whatever project I'm performance tuning some ETL process, or I'm building a um, availability group, or I'm migrating, whatever it is. It's basically saying, I think from start to finish, you know, it's gonna take us about 150 hours. I'm gonna bill you X, which is gonna get you here, you know, 28K. Very easy. That's what a lot of people think when you first get started. But I want to talk a little bit about another approach that I think is 10 million times better, and I wish I knew this from day one. Um, break it up into small different pieces and components, and I'll explain a bit why. So the first one, assessment, right? So we're thinking value, right? And this even helps build extreme value. And you'll see I have an approximate sign here for the actual hours. That's because it depends. I mean, it might be 10, it might be 40, it might be 30. It really just depends on your assessment process, how good you are at doing it, and how much value it actually retains. For example, if I was thinking of doing a massive upgrade and I knew that I can get a plan on how we should do that from start to finish to make sure we have everything lined up, 10K does not seem bad at all. In fact, I've been told many times that, at least in America, and I assume this to be pretty much true in most places all across the world, Decision makers will actually have a budget level that they could spend. So like in America, I pretty much know it's between around six and 12,000, where a manager can usually swipe a credit card and there's very little processes that they have to go through. So it's a lot easier for you to go swinging high value, set everything up for success, and be able to knock that out, and then actually go into the implementation phase, which is the second one. But the one part of this that is by far the best 
for you and even them long term is the support piece. So you look at that and you're like, great, 5K a month. I mean, you'll see that if you can do that for multiple years, it greatly surpasses everything else. Where instead over here, maybe you have some buckets and you know, maybe it takes three months, maybe it takes four months to go through all the buckets. I mean, this makes it a lot easier for you. And as long as you're going through and showing value, I've seen this model very successful. I mean, I, I, I could say I don't want to toot my horn, but during the pandemic, we didn't lose any support contracts that we had because of how much value that we provide to our customers. And so another simplified approach, you know, MSP. Um, so this would be a service provider. One thing that you can do on that level sometimes is just skip out the big project. Sometimes, you know, usually when people come to us, there is some problem, you know, and they thought of us because we're good at solving those problems. So again, you could do this assessment and then go to a monthly retainer as well. You don't have to have that big project in the middle. But the one thing for me that I never even thought of when I really got started was honing in on the support part over there. So I mentioned a little bit about becoming a thought leader, you know, as you become a thought leader and you do more stuff in your community, which we'll get into a couple of those there, your value will rise. You actually will have people that will come finding, looking for you and say, I need you. Just because they know that you have success of solving certain problems that they are having. As you do this, you can actually raise your rates. The rates I started when I way began are nowhere near what we do now for particular projects. And so speaking a little more about being a thought leader here, this is the Forbes. They actually have two definitions because they, you know, one wasn't enough, they needed two. But you know, in America, when we think of money, Forbes is a thought leader. You tend to go to Forbes.com, there's a lot of great stuff here. I'll just say in our community, there's tons of thought leaders. For example, whenever I think of HADR, clustering availability groups, I usually think of Alan Hurt, SQL HA on Twitter as an example. You could be this at any scale. I mean, I would start locally in your own environment. So for example, me, Austin, Texas. I have a bunch of people in Pittsburgh, so we kind of do the same thing in Pittsburgh, where in those two areas, we're pretty well known where a lot of people know when I have SQL Server issues, we should talk to Procure SQL. So I would start at that level locally and build that up. So where do you find gigs? The million dollar question. So the first mistake a lot of people do, because you hear the word independent consulting, you kind of think I should do this independently. Very, very bad. Now, I was very lucky where at a SQL Pass conference, I spent a lot of time talking to um, Brian Moran, who actually helped me be part of his linchpin company to actually do a lot of work. So I actually had a case where I didn't do this, but I've had a lot of friends come back to me and struggle with this here. And so I, I wanna point out, if you're just starting now, where are some great places to find opportunities? So one of them is LinkedIn. And so initially, even I would have thought, well, if I'm just starting out and I'm asking for work, it's gonna take a while for people to actually take me serious and think, well, I'm really doing this, or it's just a side thing to make more money. Um, but no, I see this quite often. Quite often, it's a great way to get started out there. Um, another place would be consulting shops. So especially if you have mid to small ones, usually the way how a lot of them work is as they get work, they'll bring in an independent consultant to kind of help with a problem and grow that until they can hire an FTE. And if the independent consultant is great, maybe that's an opportunity where they both can flip over and do a lot more work. Same thing with MSPs out there. There's a lot of them there that hire a lot of junior level people and struggle with really harder tasks like doing architecture inside of a database or for data, moving it around a lot of systems. That's a huge place where you can actually partner with a couple of those and get a lot of great opportunities. And I've actually done both of those two when I was starting out a lot. So I definitely recommend it. You know, the third thing here is you're at a conference, there's quite a few people who do consulting. You may wanna just go talk to them and say, hey, what do you do whenever you have overflow work? Or you, know, you have a bigger project and you know you need some help. I mean, that's a great opportunity to get your, get your foot in the door over there. So, 
So the next one here is being the thought leader. You know, let the gigs actually come to you. This is where you want to be. And luckily, this is where I've been for quite a while. And a lot of this has come from stuff that I've done inside of the community. So I've been very blessed where I've done a lot of YouTube videos. I've done a lot of webinars for quite a few of the vendors in the hallway that you can go see. Um, I started out blogging. It's funny. I remember Steve Jones, um, who works for Redgate, say many years ago that, you know, for every thousand people that read blogs, there's maybe one that write them. And so whether it was right or not, I can tell you that I got opportunities just because I was blogging and people thought I was the expert. I, I, I will be very honest and say I was not. I was blogging because I wanted to improve my English, and I was blogging because I didn't want to forget stuff I already did that I knew I was going to have to do again. Um, but in, in hindsight, that helped me out a lot. Same thing with being involved in user groups and um, speaking at user groups and conferences as well. These are all great things that can definitely help you be known as a thought leader starting in your local area and growing it out from there. And then finally, the big third piece here, and you might be wondering why is this here? Um, and I'm gonna explain that the biggest thing I wish every single person knew, and this is one I definitely struggled with myself, was not being afraid to say no. So remember, I, I said one of the goals is be a thought leader for a subject area, right? Well, if you say yes to anyone who will throw money at you, you're going to be doing all kinds of various different things that's going to kind of collude what you're known for. And people might think, oh, you're just a generalist that's just focusing on anything that's data or SQL related. So a key thing here is that you actually would want to be able to say no. And here's kind of the circle of why no is your best friend. Because as you start really thinking, and even before you jump to being an independent consultant, I strongly encourage that you go out and you build quite a bit of content, because that's going to start getting people to think of you. They're going to think of you whenever they have the partner that you're focusing your content on. Now, when you actually go out there and you get some gigs, the key thing I recommend as part of the onboarding part when you do your statement of work to start it, just ask and say, hey, can I get a testimonial if we finish a, B, C, whatever the task is, can you just give us a testimonial for it? Because you're going to have a lot more success up front getting it than a lot later. And so by doing those three things, building content, um, getting gigs, because if you do well, people will tell other people. When I was starting out, that was one of my biggest areas of actually getting work was from word of mouth. Then testimonials, those will actually help you become a good thought leader to where you can start to actually increase your value and people think of you a lot more. And then, of course, as that happens, you can start to actually go through and raise your rates there as well. So kind of great opportunity there for you to kind of keep that circle going on why saying no is your very best friend. So with that, thank you everyone for, for coming out here today. Here's a little bit of my info here for anyone that's online. I don't see any questions popping in here. So feel free to email me. The, the big goal of me doing this is to try to help anyone who is interested in being independent, that I could share any knowledge that was successful for me for the nine years I've been doing this. So free free, shoot me an email. I'll be here a bit for the rest of the day. And again, please go ahead and do the survey here. Um, like I said, if you don't want to give a nine, please just give me some feedback so that way I can help make my presentation better because I would love to be back here at SQL Bits. With that, thank you, everyone. I um, hope you enjoyed this wonderful session.